Another day of high theatrics in Rome and high anxiety in Europe. A technocrat interim prime minister back at the presidential palace in Rome, but who may never form a government. A president who may call early elections or try again to cut a deal with an unprecedented populist coalition. The sticking point, whether a founding member of the European Union will have leaders skeptical of the euro and who openly reject curbs on public spending. Nerves have somewhat steadied on European markets, but it'll be a short breather if there's no clarity in Italy or if it's looking like the populists will be making good on their campaign pledges to spend, spend, spend. Speaking of Europe, why is it that despite the recovery, the backlash against traditional politics seems to still be growing? After the financial crisis of 2008 and the migrant crisis of 2015, New parties have blown up the old versus uh, left versus right divide, Germany taking months to scrape together a coalition, Spain's minority government this week again teetering, and another weak minority government bringing us Brexit over in the UK. When the dust settles, what will the core of Europe look like? Today in the France 24 debate, we're wondering if contagion could spread from Italy, and uh, joining us from Berlin, Lorenzo Marsili, the author of Citizens of Nowhere, how to Save Europe from Itself, director as well of the uh, advocacy group European Alternatives. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Here in the studio, we're uh, pleased to, to uh, an honor to welcome uh, uh, some of those attending the big annual OECD Forum, the, the uh, annual talk shop of the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. Uh, Luca Vicentini is General Secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation. Thank you for joining us. Also with us, Erika Vittergren, Chief Executive Officer of the think tank and consultancy Reimagine Europa. Perhaps more on that in, in, in a little bit. I'll have to ask him about that. And uh, Branko Milanovic, he teaches at the City University of New York's Graduate School, the author of Global Inequality, a new approach for the age of globalization. That question of inequality, perhaps one of the core issues here when we talk about Italy. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, the hashtag F24 debate. Let's start with the latest, a private meeting at the presidential palace, seeing the return of five-star movement leader Luigi Di Maio just days after the president shot down the 31-year-old's pick of a Eurosceptic economy minister. The wrangling has former IMF official Carlo Cottarelli holding back on proposing a cabinet. If that means no early snap election, well, don't tell Matteo Salvini, the far-right leader, on the campaign trail. The leader of the Lega party uh, may have lost out on now becoming interior minister, but the rejection of his coalition with the Five Star has uh, since, uh, given, since Sunday given him a 10-point jump in the poll. He's all for new elections. Meanwhile, at the Campo di Fiori market in central Rome, Stefano, a flower seller, still wants to kick out the bums, all of them. They really make me sick, all of them. We're not a people who ever did something like that, but we could use a revolution right now. OK, maybe not a revolution, that might be too exaggerated, but really make a shocking statement. Go and get them all out of there, by force. We need a revolution. Okay, maybe not a revolution. What do the Italians want at this point? Well, I don't know if it is a revolution, actually. <laughs> <laughs> maybe an involution or a devolution, I don't know. Yeah, but, you know, the problem is that uh, what is happening in Italy is not isolated, unfortunately. Uh, it's a problem that we have seen also with the Brexit referendum, that we have seen happening also in other elections. Uh, this forces uh, populistic uh, or far-right or far left in some cases, like in Greece, but in any case, anti-European, anti-establishment, uh, sometimes xenophobic. Uh, well, uh, they got in power in some countries. They are gaining space in other countries. This is a general, uh, I think, European problem. The so if problem we, go is, over, we go over the timeline of the last few days, the president rejects the, the, the naming of this Eurosceptic economy minister, and the leader of the far right goes up 10 points in the polls, uh, was uh, Sergio Mat uh, Mattarella wrong to uh, 
to uh, no, I, I think make he, a political decision here? No, I think he did the right thing. And he respected the Constitution, by the way. 50% of the contents of this contract that has been signed by the two political parties that uh, were going to, to create a government, I mean, 50% of these points were against the, Euro the Italian Constitution and against the European rules. So the role of the President of the Republic was to stop that. Even if it goes against the will of the people? You know, there are rules that are in the Constitution that are the basis of democracy. And, you know, demagogy is not democracy, it's different. Luca Vicentini, you agree? Uh, Lorenzo Marsili, excuse me. Do you agree? Right. Uh, well, uh, I think there's a bit of confusion because uh, we're radically underestimating the fact that the European Union and the Eurozone in particular needs drastic and ambitious reform. And it is the incapacity of the current European and indeed national establishment to drive through that much needed political and economic reform of the European Union that is triggering the nationalist and xenophobic backlash that we're witnessing today. We're treating this as if it were something emerging out of nowhere, but it is in fact a symptom of a decaying European polity and the reckless uh, continuation of uh, an unsustainable business as usual on the part of the governing elites. You cannot uh, crush the Greeks in 2015 and continue with an economic uh, uh, stagnation in that country, crush any attempt to reform a clearly unsustainable eurozone and drive in some modicum of fiscal transfer, transfers, of investment, of uh, anti-cyclical uh, uh, economic policy. You, can, you cannot continue doing that uh, forever. Uh, there comes a point when the people rebel. And unfortunately, the rebellion is going to be uh, even uglier than uh, the, the first progressive attempt at demanding a transformation that uh, the Greek Spring in 2015 represented, and that, as we know, was, uh, was crushed without a Okay, so you, you, heard, you, heard, you heard there, uh, Lorenzo, what Luca Vicentini said. Uh, do you agree with him that uh, in, the, in the case of what's just happened in Italy, the president had to uphold the Constitution, or has he fanned the flames of populism with his uh, rejection of that economy minister? He has done both. Uh, the president's action falls completely within the powers that the constitutions uh, give to him. Any talk of impeachment is completely empty talk and uh, this truly demagogic. That said, uh, Mattarella's veto on a minister because of that minister's particular views on political economy has flamed, indeed, uh, the nationalist and the xenophobic forces of Italy. Uh, we have, if you like, traded a Eurosceptic finance minister today for a radically anti-Euro nationalist government tomorrow. But the bottom line is that Italy, as everywhere else in Europe, uh, is really the playground of two alternatives that appear uh, uh, opposing one the other, but are actually in a symbiotic relationship. Uh, the, the nationalist backlash is produced by this establishment, is reinforced by actions such as that of Mattarella. And the establishment on the other side needs the populists to create the latest Union Sacre, the latest attempt to hold the fort against the barbarians. But those two forces are two sides of the same coin. For as long as, as we're not able to change this coin, not the euro, but this political coin, this, this, virtual, this vicious relationship between the establishment and the nationalists, I think we're heading towards some very dark times. Erika Wittgren, your, your thoughts on this uh, unprecedented alliance between uh, uh, the, the anti-establishment five-star movement and the far-right uh, league, what do you make of it? Well, uh, I think that the, the key point to a lot of this is that people want change, and change that is not provided by the traditional parties, as you mentioned in the beginning. And what you can see, both on the left and on the right, is people are voting for new alternatives. Whether these are realistic, whether they're going to bring the changes that are desired, I think that people want to vote against the establishment and want to see some new ideas come up. And this is not, to be honest, original for now. If you look back in history and you saw, for instance, what was happening, even in situations like after the French Revolution, you had a similar polarization, people moving towards the extremes, um, people calling out, you know, about fake news and media in, in creating this. But I think that this is a way for people to show their dissatisfaction. But, and I think Europe needs to listen to this dissatisfaction, which is much more profound than, than uh, I think that they take credit Are we for. supposed to be in a recovery? Why, why is this dissatisfaction growing? Why is everyone searching for something new? 
I think that the financial crisis of 2008 showed that the economic policies that both the centre-right and centre-left have been driving for over 30 years didn't deliver. The trickle-down effect didn't work. It wasn't good for everyone. Globalisation wasn't helping everyone. And it, we need to rethink some of the things and also admit where we did wrong and come up with alternatives that are realistic and concrete and that actually address the concerns of citizens. All right, trickle-down doesn't work. The solutions have, uh, haven't worked so far. Branko Milanovic, I'm sorry, I'm still haunted by the question I asked at the outset. Did the president do the wrong thing then in that case by, uh, well, well let, getting in political, into making a political decision in this case? Let, let me not answer the, directly this question because really you have to be a specialist in Italian politics and you have to follow it apparently like minute by minute because we have had so many yes, different turns uh, <laughs> today. It's almost like if you were to make a play out of that, it would be a very good play. It's like a Pirandello play. It's really, you don't know what will be the next act. Uh, but I think actually what I would like to follow up on what Erika said is, well, Lorenz also, is that basically why we have this problem in Europe is essentially two reasons. One is low growth, and actually there was a crisis. You, you're speaking about the recovery, but the recovery has been really tepid, and the recovery really started only a couple of years ago. And if you take the example of Italy, Italy is one of the countries that actually is not back to the level of income that it had, you know, more than, well, 15 years ago. So essentially, we are taking, talking about a country which has not grown. On top of that, we have had an increase in inequality. And you mentioned inequality before, and indeed it has actually gone up in all European countries if you compare it today with the way it was like 20 years ago. So I think when you compare, combine these two things, low growth and rising inequality, you get really large dissatisfaction among really significant portions of the population. All right, two, two, two questions. And uh, first one, I, I've got to put it to you, uh, Lorenzo, since uh, you're in Berlin. You just heard Bronco uh, say, say how difficult it is for him as a foreigner to understand what's going on in Italy. What do you think of the coverage where you are of the crisis in Italy? Do the, do the Germans get what's going on in Italy? Well, you know that there was quite a sensation yesterday triggered by uh, Gunther Ottinger's uh, absolutely reckless statement. We're going to uh, hear it in a moment, but go ahead. Will, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. The financial markets will uh, uh, persuade the Italians to vote correctly. Then the quote was, uh, was corrected after a few hours. It wasn't uh, that the financial markets will teach the Italians. They will just persuade them gently but firmly. Uh, the, the risk is that we are sleepwalking towards uh, a confrontation between nations. And clearly the, the rhetoric in Italy is very much uh, anti-German at the moment. Uh, Salvini uh, yesterday said that, it, that, that Italy is not a French or German colony. It has to regain its national sovereignty and independence. And uh, the other side of the coin is that the rhetoric and the coverage in Berlin is, uh, is, is obviously that of a, a reckless uh, uh, Italian demand for more public spending, for more deficit spending. Uh, the problem is that uh, both sides are, are, are unbelievably wrong in the analysis. Uh, uh, the, the Italian question is not just one of deficit spending. It is one of an unsustainable currency area which does not have any political or democratic control or management over its fiscal or economic policy. And it is time that all of us uh, perhaps begin uh, behaving a little bit more like adults in a room, to quote a book by Yanis Varoufakis, and understand that uh, either we are slowly marching towards an increased polarization of the debate, uh, increased nationalism within the European Union, and ultimately an implosion of the common currency, perhaps not this year, but certainly a few years down the line, or we learn that we must transform at least the Eurozone on, into a fully fledged economic union. Yeah, I was going to say, because from listening to what you said, uh, Lorenzo, you, you, you're saying that uh, uh, the Italians don't have enough sovereignty when it comes to the question of the euro. Are you making the argument that the nation should be stronger? Um, no European has, at the moment, much of a say over their common economic or financial future. The Germans might have a little bit more uh, of that power because their government is more influential in the negotiations of the European Council. But we're essentially in a system where the so-called intergovernmental model or a decision-making based around uh, diplomatic and secret negotiation between heads of state is undermining the right and the capacity of European citizens to exercise their democratic agency as citizens of the European Union. So it is not a question of Italians needing more national sovereignty. 
It is a question of Europeans demanding the democratization of the European Union and especially of the Eurozone so as to regain the capacity to have a political debate over the kind of economic policy that we want to see implemented, the kind of fiscal policies that we want to see implemented at European level. Let me just add one line. Mm. Uh, we are too often speaking of a confrontation between nations, as if uh, Germany was uh, uh, the, the defender of austerity and Italy was the defender of expans expansionary fiscal policies. Uh, the, 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 the step that we must make is to understand that there is a part of Germany that wants a certain economic policy, a part of Italy that wants a certain economic policy, and a part of Germany and a part of Italy that wants another economic policy. And what democracy enables us to do is to rally together, to bring together a certain part of Italy, a certain part of Germany, a certain part of France, and to represent their aspirations and their ideas for a common European future within a joint parliamentary and democratic debate. The lack of this democratic debate in the European Union is what is leading to proud nations being pitted one against the other. It's either democracy or implosion. Uh, Erika Wittegren, you, you, you have from Sweden? Yes. A country where the far right is on the rise, this despite an economy that's doing well. Yes. Is it for the reasons that we're, that we're hearing? Is it because of immigration? Is it because of the feeling that, well, the European Commission doesn't answer to the people, it answers to these nation states, to this club in Brussels? I think in Sweden it's not so much about the European perspective than migration. That's the biggest thing. Sweden was the country that welcomed most asylum seekers and economic migrants per capita during the 2014-2015. The, the uh, is that rise of the far right against uh, a pushback against the EU? I think it's it's definitely a challenge towards the the EU, and it's. Um, but I think the overall concerns with Europe lies much deeper in Sweden, which is a country that doesn't have the euro, which is a country that likes its independence. Brexit is obviously something that has impacted Sweden very much, as it has um, uh, the Dutch. Um, and so I think Sweden needs to find its way in this new Europe without the UK as its number one big, uh, big partner. Um, and right, so Italy, just one of the fires. I'm going to interrupt you because we have to take a very quick break. We'll be right back. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 report. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate and... Uh, we're looking at, uh, well, the prospect of contagion when it comes to the political crisis in Italy. What our panel's been saying, the political crisis uh, that's been unfolding in Italy and that's got the continent holding its breath, really mirroring crises we're seeing elsewhere around the continent. We're talking about it with Lorenzo Marsili, uh, the author of Citizens of Nowhere, How to Save Europe from Itself and director of the advocacy group European Alternatives, who joins us uh, from Berlin it's OECD Week, uh, the big forum that's taking place at uh, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Among the attendees, uh, Luca Visantini, General Secretary of the European Union uh, Trade, uh, European Trade Union Conference. Uh, Erica Vitagren, Chief Executive Officer of the Think Tank and Consultancy, Reimagine Europa. Reimagine Europa in a word which... Well, I think it wants to, to entail that we need to come with new alternatives for Europe. The current ones are not there and I um, there is a general will for a stronger Europe most Europeans are not European citizens are not anti-Europe they are anti the current system if you look at the Eurobarometer you actually see a lot of citizens want Europe to do more on migration more on security more on a lot of things it's just the current system they don't feel that they have a place there they don't what have a place there and a question of legitimacy as well Branko Milanovic who teaches income inequality at the Sydney University of uh, New York Graduate School, and the author of uh, Global Inequality, A New Approach for the Age of Globalization. Uh, wel welcome back as well. Uh, we, Lorenzo was mentioning just before the break uh, <laughs> that uh, there was this, uh, uh, there was this um, uh, 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 interview, the European Union's budget commissioner, putting fuel on the fire Tuesday, uh, Günther Oettinger, who's German, uh, speaking to Deutsche Welle TV. Even now, developments on bond markets, the market value of banks, and Italy's economy in general have darkened noticeably and negatively. That has to do with the possible government formation. I can only hope that this will play a role in the election campaign 
and send a signal not to hand populists on the right and left any responsibility in government. In the region's verantwortung to bring in. Yeah, and the far right's uh, Matteo Salvini in Italy quick to react on his favorite medium, Facebook Live. This Mr. Oettinger, today in Strasbourg, he said it will be the markets that teach Italians how to vote better. Can you see the disrespect for democracy, for liberty, for free choice, and for the free choice of 60 million citizens from this man who has not been elected by anybody and represents a power like that of Germany and Angela Merkel's party that runs a European Union? He dares tell Italians silly things you voted incorrectly. So the stock market lowers and the spread increases. Markets will teach you to vote better next time. This wish for German hegemony, this wish for German control, it feels a little bit like a threat. Luca Vizentini, your reaction, is it a threat? When you hear uh, Commissioner Oettinger saying, well, the markets will help the, concentrate the mines in Italy. You know, we are coming back to the horrible debate we had when we had the problem with Greece, you know, always the same. We are stuck in this vicious political debate. We are pro-Europe, against Europe, pro the euro, against the currency. We are in favor of migrants or against migrants, etc. You know, but is this really the problem of people? So what are the roots of this crisis that democracy is living in Europe, I mean? Uh, Look at the Brexit referendum, for example, even without mentioning Italy. Uh, well, the regions where the Brexiters have prevailed are not the regions where there is more, more migrants. There are the regions where you have the highest levels of unemployment, the highest levels of inequalities, of social exclusion, and where globalization, the crisis and all this have hit harder. So but we, the argument in the campaign was my uh, immigrants are taking your jobs. Yeah, but of course, they are taking your jobs when you don't have jobs available. This is the problem. We are still incredibly high level of unemployment in Europe, even in countries where there is growth coming back to some, to some extent, but it's still jobless growth, as we call it. I mean, there is not improvement, real improvement in terms of employability of people, of the possibility to provide people with new jobs if they lose their jobs, with the possibility to recuperate the 30% decrease in wages that uh, European workers have faced in the last period. The increasing inequalities are not addressed by anybody. Then it's clear that if we don't address the real problems of people, we will have only to face this kind of xenophobia anti-European sentiments, anti-establishment, but you know, the replies they are providing are not the right ones, but we are not addressing the problems. If the traditional forces, conservative, progressive, etc., the pro-Europeans, the pro-democracy uh, parties in Europe, if they don't address the real problems of people, well, we will continue being stuck in this discussion about how to reform the Eurozone, how to reform the migration policy, you know, people don't care about that. This doesn't tell anything to people, and then the only messages that go through are the ones of Mr. Salvini or Mr. Di Maio. This is the consequence of the fact that there is no awareness of the reality that people live day by day on the ground. Lots of reactions on the hashtag F24 debate. Italy will not be safe till we admit that our sovereign debt made by our politicians in the 70s and 80s is literally killing us. There's a long way for Italy, and I think the worst is yet to come. That prediction from uh, Ricardo so the, the the burden of dragging around this debt, which represents what 130 percent of uh, Highest, yeah. uh, of the nation's GDP, uh, all, all the time, which helps to prevent that growth, <clears throat> the inequality that uh, we just heard mentioned there uh, by Luca. If you had, if I handed you a magic wand, Branko Milovic, Mil Mil and you were able to get wipe that debt out, how would you reduce the inequality in Italy? Well, you know, first, they don't have a magic wand. And, of course, it's, it's not easy to do that, you know. Although there are measures that have been used in the past and we have sort of diluted them, like, of course, taxation, uh, very high concentration of income from capital, which is not only specific to Italy, actually specific to all West European countries, of course, in the United States and Canada. So, actually, income from capital is very heavily concentrated. So, explain to me, in that case, how this government, which, uh, sorry, this coalition... Yeah 
comes to power on the promise of a flat tax. You know, I don't think that anybody can actually explain what are their proposals and relate it to reality. I mean, the little that I've read, it's very difficult to put these two things together. But, you know, we have to remember that it was very difficult to put together Trump's proposals and to link them to reality. So, you know, political parties can win uh, elections even if what they propose is unrealistic. But one thing that actually strikes me in the European situation now, or like in the last five or six years, is that you have a process which we all the people remember from the from the third world. We have the disarticulated societies. Disarticulated because there is a group of maybe 15, 20, or 25 percent of people, like lo people in London or Paris or Rome or Milan, even better, were, who are actually very much integrated into global economy. And doing, they're doing very well. And so they're very happy with globalization. But there is a large part of what in the olden days was where the third world was the hinterland, people who have been actually shut out of the opportunities. And I think these are the people who are voting against, uh, you know, against the UK staying in, the, in Europe, against uh, uh, established parties in Italy, or even in Spain, or Austria, or I can just keep on going, even Germany, with AFD being now in the parliament. So, you know, the same phenomenon is being reproduced in a number of countries. Being reproduced, and we're seeing how it's up, there's been an upheaval in, in the uh, Bundestag's uh, political makeup, which meant that took them five months to, to, to build a coalition. We have Spain, where the arrival of Podemos has also, and, and of uh, Suidadanos, right. have, have, uh, have changed the makeup of that parliament uh, as well. Uh, France, too, uh, because and that party didn't exist, as you know, a year ago. It didn't exist, except, yeah. of course, here it's a slightly different case because we, we, uh, the, it, it's kind of blown up both the left and the right, and it, yeah. it, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's ruling alone. The question is, does this mean we're headed for political gridlock in all these Europe, core European nations for years to come? Well, I would just say that, of course, the situation is difficult. And if you're on top of that, you add migration, which actually when I travel in Europe and my book deals with migration too, with proposals how to deal with migration, it's a huge issue. Like wherever you go, that seems to be really, if not number one, then number two. And this is an issue that is not going to go away when the summer is over. It's an issue that is going to be with us for, I, I'm sort of sorry to say that, but for maybe 50 or 100 years. Uh, uh, by the way, on that point, Lorenzo Marsili, here in Paris early this morning, there was a police raid. Uh, they uh, have uh, rounded up uh, more than 1,000 people who are sleeping rough under the Périphérique Ring Road. Uh, they're going to process them. They're taking them to centers to stay. When they process them and fingerprint them, they're going to find that many of them uh, were uh, entered the European Union via Italy. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, how Europe is handling all this? Yes, this collect connects very well with your question on the political gridlock for the years to come. Um, but first, let me say that the only way that uh, Europe is handling this at the moment is by attempting to bribe the authoritarian president, president of Turkey in order to keep refugees out of the shores of the European Union. This is a policy as ineffective and inhumane uh, as it is uh, disrespectful of the heritage of this continent. And the EU-Turkey agreement is a state on the conscience of every Democrat all across the European Union. Uh, the, the raids of today, I think, also speak loads about uh, Macron's so-called humanist uh, internationalism. We see that there is a, a, a policy of continuity uh, in different French presidencies when it comes to the management of migration flows. Uh, migration is clearly one of those issues that nation states are increasingly unable to address on their own, especially in the European Union. And this answers your question about political gridlock. I think for as long as we're not able to, to develop a truly European transnational polity, we are going to be looking at a situation where nation states are unable to manage some of the most important uh, challenges of this century, which are challenges that uh, ultimately uh, connect to the interdependency, the global, the international interdependency between peoples and between nations. Migration is a very clear example of this. Unless we set in motion a humane and effective European welcoming and integration policy, which at the moment we direly lack beyond the bribes to Turkey, clearly there's going to be 
very difficult for member states, especially those uh, uh, at the periphery or at the frontier of Europe, such as Italy or Greece, to manage on their own uh, the, the, the nearly the entirety of, of arrivals. But just as migration, uh, and, and I finish here, uh, think of, um, on the economic front, the question of tax evasion, tax havens. We have five tax havens within the European Union. Uh, this is a very widespread phenomenon. As you know, the Netherlands and Luxembourg steal the taxes of other countries by lowering their corporate taxes and doing uh, sweetheart deals with some corporations. But then Italy already has a flat tax for very rich people that it tries to steal from other countries. And Portugal has uh, a tax exemption for pensioners who move to Portugal. This is a clear situation where uh, the nation state is unable to address the, the scale of multinational tax evasion. And unless we have a transnational policy, a transnational politics within the European Union, we're going to be unable to recuperate the, the nearly 200 billion euros that, uh, that different European treasuries lose each year. So from migration to tax evasion, either we manage to build a transnational political space, collectivity within the European Union, or we are looking for years of gridlock to come as the nation states are structurally unable to address the great challenges that are coming our way. Yeah, and uh, Erica Vitagren, in the past week, uh, we've heard the French president say, hey, this crisis in Italy is all the more proof that we need to do these reforms that make Europe more integrated, that uh, give the Eurozone more teeth. The Germans are saying, no, on the contrary, this is all the more reason to wait and see. Well, I, I'm happy you mentioned President Macron, because I think that his his impact on the European debate has been so important, and it's been so important for France. And what I think we need to do is to do similar to what happened in France at a European level. And I think this debate today has really proved how we concentrate on the negative things. We do lists and lists and lists of everything that Europe does wrong or doesn't do enough. And maybe we should look a bit at what can we do? What is it that brings us together? What are the challenges we really want Europe to solve? And come with some uh, bonheur, as you say in French, back to the debate. Uh, because the current de perspectives and the current constant criticism and constant negativity also makes people feel disempowered, that there's no, there's no point in engaging it, in the debate because it's too complicated and there's nothing we can do anyways. Is it now or never for the Eurozone? to be? You're either, it's either got to be more integrated, it's got to have, uh, uh, the ECB has to have more teeth, or let's just forget this whole thing? The clock is ticking. The world is changing. The China is coming. Uh, India is growing. Uh, we have demographic changes and all these numbers. We have very clear predictions of how the future is going to look. And right now, Europe is one of the leading economic blocks. We are the biggest import-export economy. Um, this will not last forever. So if we want a place at the global table, we need to get our act together and we need to start... On currency? Yes. All right. Uh, that brings us to... We, we can't leave without mentioning the markets. Milan rebounding, rebounding this Wednesday. Uh, the market there recouping some of the previous day's heavy losses, losses that sent stocks tumbling as far away as uh, Wall Street, most impacted in the last week, banks and financial institutions impacted, to, exposed to Italian debt. And if you're watching the show from Greece or Spain, there's an air of familiarity, the kind that uh, Luca Vicentini was mentioning earlier, as we start to pay attention to the spread. This week, that can only mean one thing, the spread between Italian and German 10-year bonds. Italy and Germany, two nations uh, who share a common currency, but at very different uh, borrowing rates. Yeah, it's what you were saying earlier, we've seen this movie before, and somehow we're back in this situation. Yeah, exactly, exactly. The same movie we are seeing when, the, when Greece was going to fail or to go to bankrupt, I mean. But, you know, we are still discussing about the same formalistic problems. I mean, you know, the spread, uh, the uh, more or less integration in the Eurozone, etc. People don't understand this wording at all, I mean. Uh, you know, if you look at the Italian vote, uh, the last elections, we will see the next ones coming in a few months, but if you look at the last elections, you have seen that the Five Stars movement gathered 33% of the voters in Italy because they promised a minimum income to all the unemployed people in the south. And Lega Nord gained 17% only for the moment. Officially, they're no longer the Lega Nord, they're just the Lega. Yeah, Lega, sorry, yeah, you're right, yeah, you're right. <laughs> but actually, they still have voters mainly in the north, simply because they promised to the small and medium enterprises that were struggling with the crisis, first, the flat tax, so to pay less taxes by increasing inequalities for the others, and second, to remove the euro as a currency to devaluate again to export more. 
These were the two simple messages that were delivered in the campaign for the elections. And people understood these messages, you know, and this doesn't have anything to do with the discussion that is going on about integration, about how to save the currency, how to, uh, let's say, reduce the spread in the financial markets. People don't understand all this language, you know. Uh, Again, we are discussing, for example, at the European level, together with the European Commission, about the reform of the Eurozone and the proposal that President Juncker brought to the attention of the different member states. But again, the real actions that will be needed, like increasing investment, public and private investment, increasing wages and internal demand in the European Union, uh, increasing the level of equalities through reinforcing our European social model and making sure that people are protected by the social model. These are the three elements that could make a difference in a perspective of reform in the European Union. Which, which also Union. means nation states giving up a measure of sovereignty. Absolutely. But yeah, partially, of course, but to have something positive for people. But all these elements are not part of the discussion, not part of the narrative at all. It's only about formalism, you know. And, you know, we cannot win the battle in this way, I think. And uh, we've seen in, in Spain, um, in the build-up to the Catalonia uh, crisis, complaints there about the feckless Andalusians. Uh, it, it, there isn't a sense of what you're describing at the European level. There isn't sometimes even a sense at a national level of, of, uh, of unity, of everybody rallying around a cause. You know, it seems to me, actually, if I can just pick up on what Luca said, it seems to me that we are witnessing at the same time a sort of uh, policy paralysis, because not much has happened in terms of policies. Actually, you know, we have had the same problem with Greece, uh, what was that, five years ago, and actually policies that would were supposed either to actually improve the economy or to reduce inequality have not been sort of made. On the other hand, there is an upheaval in politics. So it's really kind of weird that you have a huge political upheaval, but when you look at policies, not much has changed. Why? Uh, I think that uh, it's very hard to say, but I think that even the, the, the parties that come to power then feel constrained, as we have seen in Greece with Syriza, which came under one platform, had a referendum, which was for one thing, and then decided to change side and to do something opposite. I think they are very much constrained from the, well, the markets and from the European rules. So it's very hard to actually break through that. Very hard to break through it uh, concretely. Uh, what would you do, uh, Lorenzo Marsili? Let me, let me start, uh, let me answer that question by something Vicentini has said about the place of Europe in the Italian election campaign. Uh, Europe was actually very present. One of the recurrent themes when migration uh, was discussed during the election, election campaign was the, the sentence, they left us alone, meaning Europe, European countries, the European Union, have not come to the rescue, have not come to the aid of Italy when Italy was and is uh, left, is alone in facing 200,000 or more arrivals by, uh, uh, by, by, by the sea. So the, the idea of a Europe that somehow leaves Europe alone was actually uh, a central aspect of the Five Star Movement and the Lega Nord campaign regarding migration and regarding uh, the scandalous idea to expel uh, nearly half a million migrants and refugees from Italy. Um, if people don't uh, understand or are not interested in so-called Eurozone reform, Form, I dare say it is not because of what Vicentini said, it's not because they don't understand it, but I think it is because they understand that the kind of Eurozone reform that is, that, that is being discussed now is ultimately meaningless. It is unable, it will be unable to address the structural imbalances in the European Union and it will be, it it will be unable to return democracy uh, to the continent. Uh, it is just going to be a very small step gradualist reform, if any reform at all is going to happen. A little bit like Juncker's investment plan that evaporated into thin air. Um, to, to close on concrete policies, there are many policies that we could be setting in motion already tomorrow. Think about the gigantic liquidity that rests all across the European Union in our <clears throat> banks. At the moment, we have a situation where the ECB continues its quantitative easing, uh, which only serves to fuel speculation in the financial markets and increase the excess of liquidity in the financial system. That investment could be redirected through the European Investment Bank into productive in, investment into productive on the ground. Into productive things on the Which uh, is... Which, which is what's needed. Yes. Unfortunately, we're running short on time. Uh, Lorenzo Marsili, yeah. I want to thank you so much for joining us uh, from you. Berlin. I want to thank uh, Luca Vizantini, Eric uh, Vitogren, and uh, Branko Milanovic. Stay with us. Media Watch is next.
And we say hello to uh, Emma James. Hi there. Yes, it seems like it was only yesterday we were talking about Italy. In fact, it was 48 hours. Um, and some things have changed, some things not so much. Uh, what's interesting to look back at is the reaction sort of a couple of days ago. This is a, a fairly right-wing journalist in the United Kingdom um, who's very much pro-Brexit. Uh, and he says, new elections in Italy likely to give bigger mandate for anti-EU parties after classic establishment carve-up EU problems just beginning. Um, and it is interesting that very much online there was a much bigger kind of presence for those who were saying, this is the EU's fault, they're meddling in Italian yeah, and democracy. Ev and everybody projects he's pro-Brexit. Uh, pro so, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, Donald Tusk of the uh, fought back the President of the European Council saying, my appeal to all EU institutions, please respect the voters. We are there to serve them, not to lecture them. And you may remember... Was, was that memo for the EU budget commissioners? <laughs> <laughs> um, and you may remember I talked about the Economist article on Monday as well, right. and it's worth revisiting this because they are one of the few who were talking about this isn't just necessarily Europe trying to manipulate. This could be the two parties involved, Five Star and the Northern League, actually wanting to force the issue and force a snap election by saying we won't go with any other finance minister than the Eurosceptic one that we know the Italian president isn't going to want to watch, uh, going to want to have um, in place. Um, that kind of scepticism has been fueled by this sort of article in Republica. Uh, this one claiming to have a scoop that uh, Paolo Savona's plan is to drive Italy out of the euro within a weekend. He has that up his sleeve, according to this publication. Um, now, this is another guy very much worth uh, taking a look at. He's a, a columnist uh, specialising in world politics and economy, and he's got lots of insights on Italy. It's well worth taking a look through his timeline. Um, he's actually got a clip of a speech here saying that um, Luigi Di Maio has been caught out lying. He tried to make out he didn't know Paolo Savona before a couple of weeks ago, uh, but here he is back in September 2016 saying that he had discussed Ital exit uh, with him and they agreed that Italy should leave the Euro. Now, after today's meeting with the president, he says uh, Di Maio has said that uh, Five Star and the Northern League don't want Italy's exit from the Euro. Euro. Yeah, sure, he says. Um, now, obviously, if there are new elections, then it would very much be seen as a referendum on the euro. Giva Hofstadt saying Italy isn't struggling because of the euro, but because of a lack of structural reform, saying it actually should be following the French model and pushing for more and more reforms. And that sounds like the lecturing that Tusk warned against. Well, indeed. <laughs> uh, uh, and just one last point before I go. Some people talking about maybe we should change this whole this whole exit thing, which really isn't a very nice word to say. Obviously, the best term for Italy leaving the EU is quitterly. Uh, but what about for other EU countries or some others that he's come up with? Austria, Belgium, Czech out and Sweden. <laughs> Sweden. <of> <laughs> Sweden, which, as you were pointing out, is not a member of the euro. But <laughs> we'll, we'll test Never it mind. if they enter. <laughs> Many thanks for that, Emma James. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.